Today we're talking about architecture. Hardware architecture, software architecture, computer architecture, which can be confusing to new programmers, and so we're gonna talk about it. Welcome back everybody. Today we're talking about architecture, a term that is used in a lot of different ways in computing, some in my opinion more valid than others. This can confuse people and so today I'm gonna try to fix that. We're not talking about building buildings, designing really neat buildings, that's really cool but that's not what we're talking about. Instead we're talking about software architecture and hardware architecture and I hope to provide a little bit of clarity on what these are actually referring to and why we should care about them at all. So let's start off with software architecture. What do we mean when we talk about a software systems architecture? is we're talking about the high-level design, the philosophy, the main components, how they work together, how they communicate. We're talking about the skeleton of the system, the different connections from each other, and we could also decide to make an event-based server. And so each of these are aspects of the server's architecture. Notice that we're not talking about down in the weeds, we're talking about fundamentally how is this thing going to work? You know, what are the, what's the big picture idea of how we're gonna design this software? So when you hear someone talk about the architecture of a software system, System, we are talking about the thousand foot view. We are not getting down in the weeds. We are talking about the large big picture decisions that were made in terms of how this system should actually be built. And yes, of course, that line between what is architecture and what are low level implementation details, that can get a little bit fuzzy. So we really just use our best judgment. But I do have one request, please don't use the word architecture because you think it impresses people because it makes your software, your programming activities sound more impressive. Dude, I was so frustrated debugging last night that I had to re-architect my whole solution for your class. <sighs> You changed a while loop to a for loop. That does not count as an architectural change. In fact, if you're writing something for my class, there's a decent chance that the project isn't even big enough to use the word architecture. Or what about this one? Man, when I started out, I used to be a software engineer. Now I'm a software architect. <sighs> Okay, sure, yeah, your company may use that as a title to try to separate out junior developers from more senior developers. That's fine, but nobody's impressed. At least, I don't think anyone's impressed. Software engineers, software developers, software architects, they're all building software, they're all solving problems using software creation, and hopefully they're all doing some design of software systems. At least I hope you're all getting the chance to do that. So anyway, rant done. Now let's talk about hardware architecture, or more, if you hear someone just say, you know, like I took a computer architecture, architecture class, they're probably talking about hardware architecture. Also, if you're talking with people that have a Mac, you might ask them, hey, what architecture is your Mac? Because uh, they come in different flavors. So the term here is a bit more specific than when we were talking about software architecture. When we talk about hardware architecture, we are talking specifically about the language, the set of instructions that your processor understands and basically what can it do. So we're talking about your processor here. This is probably your CPU. You could also have an architecture discussion about a GPU. It has instructions as well. So CPU, GPU, they all have a set of instructions, basically the language that they know how to speak. And that is what we're talking about when we talk about their architecture. So as programmers, why do we care? Well, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. It really depends sort of what level of abstraction you're working on, uh, maybe what language you're working on. So let's look at that for just a second. You see, when I write a C program like this Hello World example right here, my processor doesn't understand C. So that's why we use compilers. My compiler is going to take this code and it converts it into a lot of little hardware instructions, hopefully all instructions that my current processor supports so that my program will actually work. So I'm looking at the compiler explorer here on godbolt.org so that you can see this in action. So over here on the left, we have a simple hello world program. I figured we would start super simple. It could be any example. We just drop any C code from any of my videos in here and we could talk about it in the same way. So that's on the left, we have the C. Over on the right, you have the assembly language. Now assembly, is not your hardware instructions, but it's sort of a human readable version of your hardware instructions. So you can, I mean, I'm oversimplifying a bit there, but you can think of it as hardware instructions translated into a human readable form. Okay, now if we come over here, basically the idea of the Compiler Explorer is we should be able to try a whole bunch of different compilers, but you notice if I look at all the options available, um, most of these have, they 
specify the architecture up front. And I could select which version of GCC I want to use, but am I compiling for an ARM? So this is GCC 13.2 for an ARM, and that's going to produce different results than, let's say, if we come down here and we say I want GCC 13.2 for an AVR microcontroller. You can see we get very different results. Okay, so in this case, the AVR and the ARM, that is describing the processor architecture that I'm actually generating code for. And because each of these architectures have different instructions, the code that's generated are going to use different instructions. And you're gonna see some similarities, like you'll see pushes and pops, um, that's, those are really common. But especially like if we decide to go to x86, let's say we look at x86-64, um, GCC, let's look at the same version, so 13.2. You can see you do have push. A lot of them have ret, this return instruction. A lot of architectures will have a move instruction. And some of your architectures are going to have more simple instructions and some are gonna have uh, more complicated instructions, either more of them or fewer. Actually, the more complicated instructions that architectures often have a wider variety of instructions and more complex hardware. And that's definitely beyond the scope of this video. But the point is that they're different. So now you don't, you usually have to worry too much about this. Hello World is probably still going to behave the same regardless of which architecture you're using. And programs that are written in high-level interpreted languages like Python or Ruby or even Java, they should run the same regardless of the architecture that you're running on, as long as your interpreter is working correctly. So as long as your Python interpreter is installed correctly for the proper architecture, then Python code should pretty much run the same regardless of the architecture. But understanding what architecture is does help you understand why a program that is compiled for an Intel Mac is not going to run correctly on a newer ARM Mac, for example. Or why some simple floating point code might run efficiently on my laptop, but it's going to be super slow if I run it on an MSP430 microcontroller that doesn't have a floating point unit, right? It doesn't have those So like here's a so here's a quick example nothing fancy but you do have some floating point here and so if we come in here you can see they actually have a bunch of functions that are built into the compiler these are called a compiler intrinsics that handle floating point math because they don't actually have the floating point operations for it where something like uh, my you know if I go switch to an x86 then you're going to actually see operations that can work on those floating point values directly and so yeah so you're going to get much more efficient code so I hope that clarifies things as far as architecture is concerned. One of the things I love about this channel is that it allows me to interact with, to meet, to teach, to help people in places I've never been, places I may never go. And I get the chance to teach people who may never have the opportunity to sit down in one of my classrooms. And so for me, that's both really fun and I also think it's powerful. I like to think that this channel does something good for the world. So if you enjoy the content, if you're finding it useful, please do help support the channel in all the usual YouTube ways. It really does make a difference. Also, if you get the opportunity, I hope you can pay it forward. Now, one way to do that is through giveinternet.org. They don't sponsor this channel, they are just friends, and I really like their mission. They are a nonprofit working to try to make the world a better place, providing free technical education, access to the internet, and devices to help people get access, help students learn and become proficient in the use of technology and other just access other educational content. And these are students that otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity. So if you are looking for a way to make the world a better place, please do consider supporting them. I've got a link down in the description. All donations given through that link will be matched by another donor up to $30,000. So that is really cool. As always, I hope you learned something from this video and until next time, I'll see you later. Happy coding.